Good evening, Good ladies and gentlemen, and, and welcome. Um, we're glad we've fitted you all, all in. It's a pleasure to have you here. The uh, demand has exceeded supply by some folks who were turned away about twice again over the last few days. We'd love to have run more seminars if people had registered earlier, like many of you did. So, uh, welcome again. Welcome to the low carb community, uh, friends, family, uh, colleagues, and those of you new to understanding this. A way of seeing the world and understanding some of the science of, of nutrition and well-being. Uh, you're in for a treat tonight. It's a reasonably long session. We'll break it into three. Uh, we'll start with me. My name is Grant Schofield. I'm Professor of Public Health at AUT. I'm going to speak uh, first for a little bit. Uh, we'll have a quick break. We'll change the computers over, give you a chance to stretch your leg and stand up. That's good for you if you haven't heard. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then I'll introduce Dr. Karen Zinn. Our resident dietitian and controversial TV celebrity. Um, so I think she suggested that bread wasn't the only thing you could eat in your lunch, which didn't go down well with half of the community and did with the other half. You'll hear all about that. Uh, and then a break, and then our special guest from, uh, from South Carolina in the USA, uh, Jimmy Moore, a blogger extraordinaire. He's, he, he has the longest running health blog on iTunes. He's, he's nearing a thousand episodes. It's a a history of nutrition and nutrition controversy, uh, low carbohydrate nutrition, and it's going to be a pleasure to host Jimmy tonight uh, at the start of his low carb down under tour. So here he is. Right, so where to begin? I just want to talk, as I have been publicly in recent times, about the need for the, a need, a real need for the way. We talk about changing the way we talk about and, and think about food and our health and a return to, I've called it back to the future, a return to the way that humans have eat, eaten for most of the time we've been on the planet. We've ended up with this fad diet. Well, here I'm accused of promoting fad diets, but the real fad diet, folks, is this, uh, this food pyramid, this low-fat, uh, uh, refined, processed, fake food uh, thing that's happened for years. Uh, it's... It's been controversial. Time magazine's a good barometer of what's going on, and you've seen the, the recent covers. But uh, it's my contention, I think hopefully many of you agree with me, that in past decades we've ended up uh, either purposefully, hopefully not, or inadvertently endorsing fake food. And, and this, the USDA food pyramid, the, the Population Guide to Health and Eating, hopefully we can start to continue this public debate and relegate this to what I'm calling um, a particular genre in medicine. I'm calling it medical pornography. Uh, and it falls, there's another, just to familiarise you with the genre, um, other parts of that. Uh, there's the tickers out, um, there it is again and again. Uh, that... I think, and I think hopefully I regard as one of the biggest medical misadventures of all time, is this uh, uh, endorsement of food that affects our blood sugars, affects our homeostasis, affects every organ in our body in a negative way, and then demonising some of the more nutritious foods uh, in our food supply, including fats, um, has caused many problems. Uh, there's still a lot of scientific debate, in case you haven't heard. Uh, we believe that we're debating reasonably and fairly on science um, and we'll continue to do that. And you can be the judge of that. And I think hopefully the public will be the judge of that as the um, internet and access to information increases. Um, it's no longer the key that a few ivory tower academics get the scientific papers and, and cast their dispersions across the world. That's not the way the world works anymore. Some of those guys missed that um, and hopefully we can um, help move the public forward. So just to recap a bit of basic science, I'm going to do a little bit of science starting, starting easy and getting more complex. Uh, I'll have it to Karen who will do some more work with uh, the reality of doing dietetic practice and advising people on what to eat and then um, Jimmy with his state of the world address. So it is about insulin I think and this is really not new science that we've understood for, for decades that this hormone, insulin in particular, it's secreted to manage that teaspoon or so of glucose that floats around in your blood. You know that, don't you? You've just got this tiny amount. 
into your six, seven, eight litres of blood, this one teaspoon of glucose. Um, if it goes below that, hypoglycemia, that could end badly. Uh, or if it goes above that, that's sugary blood, which is corrosive, um, inflammatory, and damages all the organs it touches, which is all your organs. So we end up in this situation where, for one reason or another, we find it difficult to get those sugars into our blood, into our cells around our body. So carbohydrates turn up in the blood. Uh, there's, there's one, two, three of them. Um, and then insulin turns up to try and open up the side of the cell to let these, this glucose in, but it might not get it in there because most people are overfed on that particular nutrient. Uh, and we end up in a storage situation where glucose gets um, packed away in these little fat cells. So insulin, it, it, it says to the fat cells, don't burn fat, we don't need energy from you anymore. It tries to move carbohydrates into cells. If it can't do that, which it can't for many modern humans, then it's going to store it as fat. It's a storage hormone. It travels up to the, the hunger center, the hypothalamus in the brain, and says, uh, I'm going to run some interference here. Uh, I'm going to block another hormone called leptin, which tells us we're full. So the off switch is off. And then it goes to another part of the brain, the vagal nerve, and starts to down-regulate your physical activity. So you're in this perfect situation for surviving the upcoming winter. You're down-regulating your activity, your hunger switch is turned off, and you'll store your nutrients preferentially as fat. Um, you can see, as Rick Johnson from Colorado describes this in his great book, The Fat Switch, this is exactly what this is. It's a switch to get ready for winter. It's a perfect, perfect little system. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, and, and we know bears, for example, don't get fat on salmon. They certainly eat them, but uh, a bear getting ready for hibernation has exactly the same metabolic response. It might eat up to 10,000 grapes in a day to stimulate this exact fat switching system. So you can end up disposing of the glucose in your blood, uh, but you'll do that by hypersecreting insulin. And we call this hyperinsulinemia. And I, that, to me, and this is the hypothesis I want to put forward scientifically. Uh, at the moment, I'm not the only one doing this, but I think we need to speak louder about this. This is really a, a nice unifying theory for our health, help us understand what's happened to us in terms of the modern world. It's this carbohydrate-provoked high insulin um, that, that causes damage around the body. It switches us into this mode. It was meant to be a temporary mode. It was meant to be in terms of starvation, uh, survival, and that just doesn't happen for most modern humans. We become what I call dysregulated. So metabolic dysregulation runs rife, uh, and that's not something we're talking about. We also can tell when we look carefully that there's a whole bunch of things that cause this, cause this dysregulation. Here's a few that I know about. Uh, stress makes you insulin resistant. A poor night's sleep, probably through similar uh, mechanisms in the adrenal axis. Uh, too much exercise can be inflammatory, you can overdo it, um, as is too, too little exercise can cause insulin resistance. Smoking, if you haven't heard from Dr. Obvious, that's um, implicated in poor health. Um, a whole raft of things that we don't understand in the environment and pollution can be inflammatory and cause insulin resistance. A whole bunch of dietary related factors, sugar of course, um, through a bunch of different pathways, fructose and, and whatnot. Uh, some particular types of fats, trans fats and, and uh, recently uh, manufactured seed oils, again not part of the human food supply until just recently. Uh, unfortunately so does a high alcohol diet um, through the same mechanism as sugar. Um, Probably your genes and your ethnicity do. Some people, I think Pacific people in particular, in my observation, are very easily insulin resistant, and there's good reason for that in, in an insecure Pacific food supply. Um, maybe you just get more insulin resistant as you get older, but it could be everything else conspiring. Um, being fat itself, of course, promotes the problem, as does continued high insulin. Uh, and the latest one to add the list is high iron. So it just turns out this is an interesting issue um, and could have um, be part of some of the stuff we see with red meat, uh, is that, that uh, high iron in itself is insulin 
uh, resistance causing. We don't really understand much about that, but we can, um, I've added that to the list this morning on the basis of a few papers. So that's uh, modern life, really. Uh, <laughs> And so, yeah, but, so, but there's a few workarounds, aren't there? I mean, obviously, um, and I think the paleo community in particular would agree that we want to minimise most, if not all, of those things. We want to work, work towards a lifestyle that more reasonably mimics the, the human condition. But if you are insulin resistant, then you're going to need to think about uh, what you do with dietary carbohydrate as well and, and restricting it. Because... Uh, I, I, we drew up this diagram with a gingerbread man um, because we know that that high insulin is really the antithesis of most of what we call modern disease. Because I remember I said high insulin and high blood sugars, they damage and cause problems in every organ in the body and that's why they're implicated in diseases of almost every organ in the body. So this is really a much more unifying theory about modern chronic disease, that uh, there's a common problem here. It's insulin resistance and it's added refined dietary carbohydrates. So you combine modern lifestyle with the modern food pyramid and you've got a, a, a health disaster really um, and it's something we're not talking about. And that's why we've suggested, obviously we're not the first to have this idea, that uh, you might want to think about restricting the amount of carbohydrate you eat on the basis of how insulin sensitive you are. So we talk about this term of carbohydrate tolerance. So some people, my 13-year-old son, can tolerate dietary carbohydrates. He moves them, he's insulin sensitive, and he can eat a wide range of foods and getting quite a lot of carbohydrates. He doesn't, as a matter of fact, because he's accidentally, without knowing, on a LCHF diet because he's in my family. Uh, <laughs> But he could, uh, in principle. Whereas I'm less carbohydrate tolerant, uh, my wife probably less again, uh, and uh, we need to restrict more carefully that load. Um, and then there were people beyond us again who are in more pre-diabetic and diabetic stages that will have to be even more careful. So this idea of one diet fitting all people is, was always complete rubbish, and, and especially now, what we understand with modern science is. So there is a, a ketogenic diet isn't for everyone. You might choose that because it suits you. Um, but we can vary some of these things depending on our uh, uh, metabolic status. All in the context of eating uh, whole actual food. So and the, the, I've been promoting the concept. I don't, no one's really taken off with it, but um, someone might. I've tried to say, ditch the GI factor. Let's talk about the HI factor. It's the... Um, human interference factor. So if it was recently alive, then chomp it up and you'll probably be right. Um, and if it's got a label on it to identify it as food, um, that should be a fair clue that you should, you know, step away, you step away from the label, folks, because it's not, you know, if you have to, you know, in this ridiculous traffic light system where chocolate milk's rated above full fat milk and this sort of thing, it's, you know, there's, there's going to be controversy. They're going to get it wrong. Um, and the mere idea that you need a label to identify food as being actual food um, surely must tell you something. Yeah? <laughs> okay, good on you. Okay, so that's insulin um, in a nutshell. Uh, and it's also not like we don't know about diets, contrary to what you see in the paper in The Lancet and other things in recent times. Um, we know how different diets work, and we know that when you put people on diets that are better than the standard American diet, processed carbohydrate and fat, then people do better on all those. They're better than anything. It could be a vegan one, it could be a low fat, it could be anything. But we actually can do better than that. And we do this from drug trials. We quantify in head-to-head -head comparisons how people do and how individuals we do. We know some people are harmed by diets, they'll put on weight. Some people, nothing will happen. And some people will lose some weight. If it's weight loss, they're interested. I've just chosen one. Uh, so in this one, for example, this is the A to Z diet study by Chris Gardner and co from Stanford. Um, these are individual people's weight loss over, um, over six months, actually it could be 12 months, 12 months, with uh, percent weight loss in each bar as a person for a different type of diet. The top one's the low carbohydrate, high fat diet. Those are the sort of people in green bars here, those are the people who benefited from going on this diet. They lost some weight. 
So there's a number of people who benefit from the low carb high fat. Of course, some people you give them exactly what I'm talking about and nothing happens to them. That's that group, the orange. And then some people actually are harmed. They put on weight. That's those people. So that's a normal scientific trial and it's true in every part of science. I think we need to understand that. Not everyone benefits. Some people are harmed. So for example, with, when you take antibiotics for a, for a bacterial infection, the number to treat is six. In other words, of every six people that take it, only one will actually benefit above placebo control. The other five will just carry on as, as, as normal. We think of them being as 100% effective. They're not. It's one in six people that benefit. This is considerably more on these diet interventions, so they're actually quite good. Here's a couple of, this is, uh, uh, Barry says, zone diet, less people benefit. About the same, nothing happens, and more people are harmed. So all things being equal, you'd probably rate that as inferior, but still works for some people. This is another Mediterranean-style diet that'll learn. Uh, sort of equivocal, less people harmed, I guess, than the zone, at least. And this is the current dietary recommendations, the AHA Heart Foundation type guidelines for the low fat. Um, and that's, the, you know, some people benefit. Some people nothing happens and some people are harmed. So that's the sort of judgments we're making when we're comparing these things head to head, folks. It's, it's not like this doesn't work and will make you sicker and this is 100% good for everyone. That's not what happens in scientific studies. Some people will be harmed, some will benefit. But we can judge the magnitude of that. Not only that, we can go in deeper again and we could say are there subgroups that benefit especially. So this is the same study and they went back and, and on the left here it's the low fat diet. On the low fat diet who loses weight? Only the insulin sensitive people, the insulin resistant don't do well on this diet. On the low carb high fat, insulin sensitivity isn't a factor, they don't do equally as well. And I think that's a really telling and important thing when we're thinking about what to prescribe people to eat and think about what we should. The people who most need to benefit from these diets do so when they restrict their carbohydrates and eat more fat. And this is again not new science. This study is, these studies are getting on to be 10 years old now since they were initially carried out. This is, is not new stuff. It just hasn't crept into uh, actual society mainstream or anything like that, which is unfortunate. Uh, I guess people are now saying, well, if you're a diabetic, if you're insulin resistant, then perhaps this is uh, Feynman and co, some good US researchers, based this earlier this year claiming that, and I agree with them, that uh, diet low in carbohydrates should be the frontline treatment for diabetes. And that's, you know, we're talking about a, a disease where you can't move glucose into your cells. Oh, I don't know, maybe you could eat less of it. I don't know. What do you reckon? Uh, and... A colleague of mine, Gary Fecky in Australia, puts it like this. He goes, just imagine you've got a kid with a nut allergy. You can either keep feeding them the same amount of nuts and give them more EpiPens, or you can take away the nuts. <laughs> well, it's funny when you say, well, it's not funny if you've got the nut allergy, but it's, 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 it's ridiculous when you say it like that, but that's exactly what we're dealing with with diabetes, folks. Uh, there's also the concern, of course, if you eat lots more fat, then your body will go to, to custard. All of the things we consider to be risks of poor health, cardiometabolic risk factors, cholesterol, and blood pressure, and these sorts of things will get worse. And that's not what happens. The orange here is the metabolic response. Down is better, except for HDL, cholesterol, which up is better. Um, orange is the high fat diet, blue's the low fat diet. So under Randomized control trial clinical conditions, um, people who eat more fat improve all the things in modern medicine we regard as metabolically risky much more than people who um, eat this heart foundation style low fat diet. It's not to say that the heart foundation doesn't provide some benefit over just moving your eating a bit, it does, but these other ones outperform it. Um, and again, uh, the same study. This is, these are markers of inflammation, and, and we now understand this inflammation, the sugary uh, substances in the blood touching the capillaries and the blood vessels and the organs and causing them damage is what we call inflammation. Inflammation is reduced markedly in the high-fat diet, um, and if anything stays the same or goes up in the low-fat diet, and that's telling. These are important metabolic risk factors, and I feel 
um, at least publicly in the media and with my colleagues and uh, other academics and medicine around the world, that we've had to sort of defend ourselves. They're going, well, there's, you've got no proof these are good for people. It will kill them with no benefit of long-term uh, benefit. And I really feel that the burden of proof isn't, is there. Uh, these aren't 40-year studies, but if these metabolic risk factors are worth anything in medicine, which they are, um, then these diets are at least not inferior um, and for the people who need them most are superior. So we, we can move this conversation along. Of course, um, the showstopper seems to be this, um, saturated fat, um, which isn't even a food. It doesn't occur by itself in nature. There's no such thing. You don't go, oh, I'm just going to dig up some saturated fat here or um, I'll pull off the saturated fat from this animal. It doesn't happen. Lard um, is a third saturated fat, a third monounsaturated fat third polyunsaturated, so you know, it's not a food, it doesn't come as anything. Nevertheless, um, it's become a contention because people have become convinced that um, this fat, it seems solid at room temperature, if you pour it down your sink and it hardens up, it'll clog the sink and probably the same thing's happening to your arteries. Um, and that was a sort of fair assumption, I can see where you were coming from, I used to think the same thing frankly, um, but I was wrong. And how do you make sense of all this scientific riffraff and jumbo and people coming at one another and it's a totality of evidence and this guy doesn't know, you're not qualified, you are qualified, who, you know, how do you make sense of that? Well, I've, hopefully I can do that tonight and what I've done is I've taken out the two studies most often quoted by the pro-saturated fat crew to say, look, this is the totality of the evidence. And what, they are what we call meta-analyses, and that's where you get all the studies that have ever happened, and you combine them, and therefore you get a much better chance of detecting effects. Uh, there's two studies, one's uh, in a thing called a Cochrane Review, that's a, a, a meta-analysis of 48 randomised control trials, not, not long-term studies, but certainly um, good quality studies. And the second is this one on the right in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, a, uh, a, a summation of all the cohort studies, which isn't nearly as powerful, but you get a lot more people. We, we, we started following people here, we saw what they were eating, and we saw what happened to them over the long term. And we can model these statistically, we can do, make a lot of assumptions, but we can make some decisions about uh, how saturated fat affects people's health. So... Uh, and remember, these aren't the only two meta-analyses. There's, there's quite a few others um, of high quality, most of which the, the, a lot of people will dismiss unfairly. Um, I haven't chosen those. Those show no effects of anything, but I've chosen the ones which do some effect, show some effects. And let's just explore this logic, because I think you'll find it interesting. So here's what we know. When you look at these studies, both these studies, what you see is this. Um, if you substitute carbohydrate for saturated fat in people's diet then either nothing happens or it provides some evidence of harm. So in other words, taking away saturated fat and carbohydrates could either do nothing to your health or it could harm you. So that's hardly evidence for removing saturated fat, so I'll give that the cross. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's such a thing. Uh, who knew? Um, the same is true for monounsaturated with saturated fat. If you substitute one for the other, um, you see no, it's benign, there's no effect of, of benefit for adding monounsaturated fat in these studies, we'll give that the cross as well. Uh, there is an effect here though, and this is the sum, this is what has driven nutrition policy for 50 years, here it is. If you substitute polyunsaturated fats for saturated fats, um, this doesn't discriminate between the omega-6 and omega-3, so who knows what's going exactly on there, then you do see um, it's back. Uh, some benefit in reducing cardiovascular mortality. Not total mortality, not other diseases, but cardiovascular mortality. And that, that's important, that's been our biggest killer, and we should take some notice of this result. And we do. So it's not like we're ignoring this result. But here's the logic. Because what they didn't ask, of course they didn't ask this, because it wasn't driven by the hypothesis that saturated fat was bad for you. Uh, this will be the most complicated thing I say this evening. What happens if you take polyunsaturated fat and you add it to saturated fat or carbohydrate and replace it with, or if you replace carbohydrates or monounsaturates with that? In other words, you keep saturated fat constant and you add even more fat. They didn't ask those questions, and I wish they had. 
Only one study has asked that question specifically to my knowledge and it was published only a couple of months ago. Uh, and it's a cohort study, it's not a powerful study, it's not a large study, but it does follow the cardiovascular uh, incidence and death. Um, and they found um, that that was beneficial as well. So if you, if, you, if you think about that logic there, that's the totality of the evidence for this particular thing, saturated fat. I don't think it adds up. What that does say is that when people are eating low amounts of some polyunsaturated fats, and it could be omega-3s, um, it could be some essential omega-6s, I don't know, then adding more fat is beneficial. How that has translated into a low fat in our current New Zealand and our future New Zealand guidelines is not clear to me. But that's, that's really the state of the field. Of course, we've had to study this very carefully because this is of, of hot debate. Um, the last thing I wanted to finish with is this idea of fats in your blood. I, I think this is really very interesting stuff. You know, there's fat in your blood, because um, eating it's one thing, but if it gets in your blood, it's another thing. Uh, how does fat get in your blood? Well, you can follow fats in people's blood by feeding them. You give them a meal. This is what happens to people when you give them a low-fat, high-carbohydrate, um, heart foundation type meal. This is triglycerides, fats in the blood. That's the, what we call the postprandial response. That's what happens. Um, same meal here, but for a different group, you see the same response. So we're happy about that. This group, we put on a low-carbohydrate, high-fat regime for a while, um, and that, then we give them a meal that's three times higher in fat and three times higher in saturated fat, and lo and behold, the fats in their blood are half. Oh, how did that happen? Because we fed people more fat, including saturated fat, but the fats in their blood were half what they were when they fed them a lot of carbohydrates because sugar and carbohydrate are part of the driver and mechanism for retaining fats in the blood and driving fatty acid metabolism. So, um, and this group got the same diet again and you sent the same response. And I think that's a telling factor, isn't it? It isn't eating fats that drive the, the fats in your blood. They do a bit, but it's carbohydrate that drives that, especially sugar. And that's something we've neglected uh, for a long time. And it's not until these feeding studies have come along that we've noticed this. Lastly, and this just came out recently in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, um, these are cool studies. And, and they're not experiments, but what, here's what they did. Don't read that, for goodness sake. Um, <laughs> many of us couldn't. They, uh, they get 340-odd thousand people in 1993 across eight European countries. They figure out, which is difficult, what they're eating at the time. Then they draw blood, and they keep that blood. And then they go back later and look at that blood. And what they can do, it's really cool. So they can go in and not just look at the fats in the blood, but they can look at the fatty acids in the blood, and they vary in their carbon chain length. So we can look at the length of the fatty acid and we can tell where it came from. We can tell if it came from dairy fat, from very long chain fats like coconut oil we can, uh, and, and other ones. We can see if it was, maybe it was not from dietary fat at all, it was generated by, by the liver from carbohydrates. So we can look at chain link and we, we can try and decide where the fat came from if it was related to disease. So what they do is that you know, after, after some time, then 12,000 of these 340,000 have developed diabetes. We match them up with people that looked the same at the baseline but didn't develop diabetes. And this is a, called a case control cohort study. And we try and figure out, well, do the fats in the blood predict disease? And they do. So um, even chain fatty acids, saturated fats in your blood, if they're even chain links, predict harm. And the question is, where do even chain length fats come from? Well, some could come from diet, from things like avocado, but you'd have to eat a hell of a lot. But they can also come from what we call, um, big word, endogenous de novo lipogenesis. In other words, they're produced by the liver from eating dietary carbohydrates. So those ones are harmful. What about the ones that are beneficial? The odd chains and the very long chains. Well, odd chain fatty acids don't come from the liver. They're not generated by carbohydrates. These are from high-fat dairy. Um, oops, we got that wrong, didn't we? When we described butter as the most poisonous substance in the New Zealand food supply. Uh, oops. Um, and switched to margarine. Uh, and the very long chain, such smaller but consistent effect. So we're starting to, and it was only yesterday that I noticed a, a, an editorial about two studies in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition now going, really, 
the evidence for the benefit of high fat dairy, especially in diabetes, is convincing. And, and frankly, I agree. So, you know, we can start to overturn some of these myths, uh, particularly important in New Zealand given um, the quality of that dairy that we have. Just, you know, we hear about cholesterol. I think we can, you know, and for, for some populations, these are older populations, total cholesterol really is, predicts benefit. Um, L, HDL cholesterol does as well. Um, and sometimes even LDL cholesterol does for older populations, and it can be a risk for other populations. So, you know, the, relying just on that, these cholesterol numbers is no longer adequate. I really think we need to concentrate on this other one, this fat in the bloods, triglycerides, fasted triglycerides. That's, that's an, a, such an important marker. If you're not getting that measured by your doctor and doing it fasted and, and thinking about what that is, I think you should be. Uh, the reason you should be is that you've, you've heard, if you haven't heard, um, we've now got a much more nuanced understanding of, of cholesterol and cholesterol metabolism and, and we used to think about LDL cholesterol as being harmful. We now understand that it's got two subfractions, these small dense lipoproteins which can be dangerous and these large buoyant ones which seem to be benign. There's actually two nanometers difference between them so there's not like large fluffy and small dense, they're microscopic differences nevertheless. Um, how do you tell whether you've got lots of these little nasty ones or the big, nice, fluffy ones? Well, it turns out that the triglycerides in your blood can tell you almost all of that. So um, if you've got triglycerides under about one, then you'll have this uh, phenotype A, which are the, are the large, fluffy ones, almost exclusively. And as your triglycerides start to go above one, you start to almost exclusively develop the dangerous atherosclerotic, small, dense ones. So it's just such an important measure, and it's sitting out there. So if you're not getting that done, get it done. It's just a nice one. That and, and um, HDL cholesterol are, uh, I think, where the science is at. If you want to see a good talk about this, uh, get online and, and search for uh, Ken Sakaris's work in Melbourne, a pathologist. Uh, we'll put that link on this talk as well. So we need a new pyramid. Um, my view of the pyramid is it looks like this. We need good science. We need to take into account um, what's happened in previous cultures. They knew a lot about food because they damn well had to because their survival depended on it. Uh, and we should take into account what happens in practice. And practice isn't just in doctor's surgeries. It's with you. It's on the internet. It's with bloggers. It's with shared experience. And that shared experience is changing humanity. So why not take advantage of it? That's my new pyramid. Uh, and this is what I put forward to the Ministry of Health with Dr. Zinn. Um, this is what we think the New Zealand Food Guidelines should look like. We're calling the real ones based on real food for real people with real evidence, which is a dig at most people. Um, <laughs> uh, but here we go. Um, enjoy food, nutritious foods every day, um, including plenty of fresh vegetables and seasonal fruit. Yep. Uh, buy and prepare food from whole, unprocessed sources of dairy, nuts, seeds, eggs, meat, fish, and poultry. Of course. Uh, keep sugar, added sugars, um, and processed foods to a minimum um, in all foods and drinks. Duh. Uh, if you drink alcohol, keep your intake low. Alcohol is especially metabolically dysregulating. If you're insulin resistant, it's going to cause problems. And most important of all, I think, is prepare, cook, and eat minimally processed traditional foods with family, um, friends, and your community. And it's, we, we lose this discussion in society about the importance of food in this medium. It's not just about the carbohydrates and the fats and the vegetable oils and the sugars, actually. Um, you know, food is something to be enjoyed and I've been trying to invent um, what I've called the Schofield keyboard test. So if you work in a desk job and you go and get your keyboard and you bang it upside down and stuff falls out, uh, um, especially if it's grains you're in trouble, but um, you know, if, it, if, if stuff falls out it's just wrong at so many levels guys. Uh, you, you know, you've been multitasking which um, most men are hopeless that I've heard. Uh, you're you're um, not enjoying food with friends, family, and you're not mindful while you're eating it. So there you go.